1996, I was very fortunate to be involved in a paper published in the journal Nature, which revealed a massive lake underneath the ice in the middle of East Antarctica called Lake Vostok. It's 250 kilometers long, it's about 80 kilometers wide, and it's over half a kilometer deep. And all of that lake is underneath 3.7 to 4 kilometers of ice. It's one of the world's top 10 largest lakes, either by area or by volume. And the discovery of that lake is quite an interesting story. Now, it began in the late 1950s. There was a, a Russian expedition to Antarctica as part of a global program called the International Geophysical Year, also referred to as the International Polar Year. Russian scientists were traversing over the ice in East Antarctica from the edge of the ice sheet right into the middle, at the same time as American scientists were doing a similar thing in another part of Antarctica. What the Russians were trying to do is to get to the very heart of the East Antarctic ice sheet, and they were using seismics to do that. So what happens with seismic surveying is you drill two holes, one hole uh, for the, for the uh, explosion and another hole to receive the sound energy. And it takes about a day to do that. And you put your charge in and you put your um, geophones in and you let the charge off an explosion and the sound wave travels down into the ice sheet, bounces off the bed of the ice sheet and then goes back up to the surface where you can record the travel time. Now you know the velocity of sound in ice, and so it's a simple calculation to convert the travel time of the sound into an ice thickness. And, uh, and that's what Russians have been doing. And it was an amazing, amazing thing to have done. To get a, in 1957 and 58, we knew virtually nothing about the ice in Antarctica, the ice thickness in Antarctica. And what the Russian survey showed is that the ice in East Antarctica is two, three, sometimes four kilometers thick. Now every data point that was collected took about a day to do, and then you pack up all your equipment, put it onto your tractor, and then you drive to the next point, maybe 10, 15 kilometers away. You get one data point every day if you're lucky. Sometimes it's one data point every two or three days. And so building a transect, a, a profile of information, takes many weeks to do. But that's what the Russian uh, survey did. They went to a place which they called uh, Vostok Station. And Vostok Station has been set up ever since then. It's been running for over 60 years. And then they headed further into the glacier as, uh, as well to uh, a place called Sovetskaya. And an amazing place called the Pole of Inaccessibility where they stopped and then returned back. A leading figure in the Russian expedition was Andrei Kapitsa. Andrei Kapitsa was at Moscow State University and he was in charge of the seismic collection. He did it in the 1950s and in the early 1960s as well, along the same traverse route uh, from the edge of the ice sheet towards Vostok Station. And, and the purpose was to get to gather information about the thickness of the ice. He did that uh, and very successfully. So in the 1960s, British scientists were developing a new technique called radio echo sounding. Radio echo sounding is just like seismic exploration, but it uses radio waves rather than sound waves. And the great thing about using a radar is that you don't have to put it on the ice itself. You can put it in an aircraft and you can fly your aircraft at 300 kilometers an hour and get a huge amount of information. The development of radio echo sounding in glaciology allowed the rate of data acquisition in terms of measurement of ice thickness, to be increased by five orders of magnitude is an amazing step change in our ability to measure large ice sheets. Now, you get reflections of the radio wave on the bed of the ice sheet, and usually you see hills and valleys uh, covered by ice. It's an amazing thing. But on occasions, on occasions, you see the ice bed to be extremely flat, like a mirror. And in those situations, that's where you have water underneath the glaciers. And sometimes the water collects in, in big hollows and it forms lakes. Now we now know there are over 400 lakes underneath the ice in Antarctica and we know the largest of those is, is Lake Vostok. The UK team 
were a, a, around Vostok Station several times, but they never really pieced together that there was a massive lake there. It took until the late uh, 1980s and the early 1990s for another technique to come along, and that was satellite remote sensing. So a European remote sensing satellite which uh, allowed very high precision uh, measurements of the surface of Antarctica was put together in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And what it showed was all around Vostok Station, it, the ice sheet surface was amazingly flat, amazingly flat. And what the UK scientists and the Russian scientists with Andrei Kapitsa did was they put a number of data sets together. What they found was that the lake, this big lake, as depicted by the flat surface, corresponded really well to the radio echo sounding of where the lake started and stopped. And what Andre Kapitsa then understood was there was a massive lake underneath Vostok Station. And what he knew 30 or 40 years earlier is that he collected seismic data from that site. And so Andre Kapitsa and Gordon Robin, who was the UK lead during the radio echo sounding, uh, and uh, Jeff Ridley, who was the remote sensing person, Igor Zotikov, another Russian glaciologist, and me got together in Cambridge in the middle of the 1990s and assembled all the information. The seismic data from the 1960s, the radio echo sounding data from the 1970s, the remote sensing information from the 1990s, and we put it all together to show that Lake Vostok existed and that it was massive in terms of its surface area and that the water depth was over half a kilometre deep, one of the top 10 largest lakes in the world underneath the ice in the middle of East Antarctica. So understanding Lake Vostok and also understanding that there are now 400 lakes that we know about underneath the ice in, in Antarctica, that has uh, been very interesting from a number of scientific perspectives. The first is that on planet Earth, wherever there's water, we find life. Now it so happens that these lakes are going to be isolated from the atmosphere for hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of years. And so if there is life in these systems, they would have been uh, adapting and evolving in a way that is completely different to the rest of the planet. And so from a microbiological perspective, these are very interesting places to try to explore and see what's in them. These are lakes which are, have very low energy as well, very little flow of water. And so any sediments that accumulate on their floors are going to be undisturbed. If you have undisturbed sediment, then what you get is a record of past change, past ice sheet and past climate change. And so we're very interested in uh, getting the sediments that can tell us about the history of the Antarctic continent, potentially going back millions of years in a way that ice cores can't take us back that far. So those are the two main scientific drivers. A third is that wherever there's water at the bed of the ice in Antarctica, the, the ice starts to flow more quickly. So understanding the hydrology underneath the ice in Antarctica is a major discipline in glaciology because that's going to tell us about how the ice flows and how the ice sheet is going to change in future. One of the strange things about Lake Vostok is that Vostok Station it lies over it. And Vostok Station is very well known for having an ice core um, extracted from that. It's, about, it's over three kilometers long and that ice tells us about the climate, Earth's climate, for the last 440,000 years. It's an amazing thing. Uh, what Russian engineers did in January and February 2012 is they extended that ice core downwards into the lake. And at the end of January uh, 2012, uh, Lake Vostok was the first lake to be accessed by people using uh, the ice core, led by Valery Lukin, a Russian glaciologist. Uh, haven't yet sampled that water um, thoroughly yet, um, but there are other places in Antarctica, over 400 other subglacial lakes, that we try to do. I led a UK team into a lake called Lake Ellsworth. And unfortunately, our drill that we were using didn't work, so we've yet to do that. And a US program uh, looked at getting into a lake called Lake Willens, which is right at the edge of Antarctica, underneath thinner ice, and they did that. Uh, the big questions about uh, Antarctic subglacial lakes, is there life in them, is it unusual, what are the climate change history records like? Those are still big questions and they still need to be answered. So we've been working on Antarctic subglacial lakes 
for, for many years. It's got a history of over 60 years now, but we still yet to really answer the big questions. So exploring subglacial lakes is far easier said than done. The challenge is to drill through three, four kilometers of ice to get a hole, to deploy some equipment into that hole, to lower it down into the lake, to take the measurements and the samples in a deep ocean type environment, and then bring it, bring it back to the surface. The two major challenges, the first is that the surface temperature is gonna be minus 20, minus 30, maybe minus 40 degrees centigrade. Very hostile environment. Working in those places is very difficult to do. Limited resources, limited amount of time uh, to do it. The second challenge is that the whole experiment needs to be done completely cleanly because for two reasons, these are pristine environments and we wouldn't want to contaminate them. But the second reason is the levels of life and chemicals that we'd be trying to measure and sample are also likely to be at quite low levels. And so unless we have completely clean equipment, we'll just be in danger of measuring the things that we take down with us. So working toward understanding subglacial lakes in Antarctica is one of the most challenging things we can do in environmental science right now. Drilling down to three or four kilometers of ice in the middle of Antarctica is very difficult at the best of times and having to do it cleanly gives us another challenge, which is why we haven't yet solved uh, and answered the big questions. So we've been working on subglacial lake exploration for, for over 60 years. An organization called the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, called SCAR, which is lots of international partners all working together to understand Antarctica, have been thinking about Antarctic subglacial lake exploration for 20 or so years themselves. And the great thing about SCAR is that different nations come together and they start to share their plans. There's been a lot of discussion about subglacial lake exploration as if it's some sort of race, like a space race or something like that. And it might appear that way when you consider there's a Russian program to drill into Lake Vostok, a UK program to drill into Lake Ellsworth, and a US program to drill into Lake Willans. There's also interest from Chinese um, uh, scientists, Korean scientists, you know, there's a lot of different nations that have their different interests. What SCAR does, which I'm really grateful for, is allows a venue to share information. And so I always say to people, if tell me, is it a race to get into these lakes the first? I said, well, if it was a lake, we wouldn't be telling anybody what we were doing. But in SCAR, the Scientific Committee on, on Antarctic Research, everyone's results uh, uh, is clearly laid out because we've got a lot in common, we've got a lot of information to share. We have major international symposiums. I organized a symposium in Baltimore in um, 2010 and another one uh, just outside London in 2016 where scientists from all over the world come together uh, to debate what they've learned and share their results. So it's a truly international uh, piece of research.